So my name is Sarah Milligan, um, and I am with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. I'm at the Oklahoma State University Library. Today I'm talking with Dr. Jared Taylor um, about his experience um, during the COVID-19 pandemic in Oklahoma. And uh, today's date is December 7th, 2021. Why do I always have to stop and really think about that? December 7th, 2021. Um, and this interview is going to be archived at the Oklahoma State University Library. Um, and it's a project that was supported by the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Um, all right. So that's it. That's like the most formal piece of video of this. All right. Um, so I would actually like to start with a little bit of background. So um, can you just tell me a little bit about like where you're from and how you ended up coming to OSU and a little bit about your research background? Yeah. So. Um I am. I grew up in West Virginia. Um, yeah. uh, did two years of undergraduate study in political science and economics at West Virginia University. Yeah. I uh, worked for an attorney. Figured out that wasn't what I wanted <laughs> to do, and so changed paths and uh, was planning to go to vet school. Uh, planned to go to Virginia Tech. I became a resident of Virginia. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to Virginia Tech. But uh, there, there's a unified application process for veterinary schools called VINCAS. And so basically, if you're applying for one, you can apply for as many as you're qualified to, to apply for. And yeah. I, I looked at what other schools I was qualified to apply for because uh, political science economics doesn't meet a lot of the prerequisites, you know, for a lot of vet schools. So I looked at what other vet schools I, I met the prerequisites for besides Virginia Tech yeah. and, and Oklahoma State was one. And uh, my wife, uh, she wasn't my wife at the time, but we were, she eventually became my wife. And I neither had it been uh, west of Mississippi at that point. So I was like, Oklahoma, what? What is Oklahoma, right? And so um, I did a quick search. This was uh, before Google, or at least before Google was a, a big thing. And I uh, saw that Oklahoma had more, one of four states, I think, had more cattle than people. And I said, that's all I need to know. Um, <laughs> So I, I actually did stay in Virginia, got my DVM at Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. um, but we traveled to, to Oklahoma various times during my veterinary education and uh, became very intrigued and desired to move out here. And so when I graduated with a DVM, we actually found a, a, a good uh, professional opportunity in Southwest Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so practiced there for a year and a half. Um, got an opportunity to get a master's in public health degree uh, at the University of Iowa. And so we left practice and, and went uh, north to uh, Ames, Iowa, worked at Iowa State and uh, concurrently with my MPH and, mm -hmm. and did that in a year. And then uh, wanted to escape the cold north, loved the people, did not like the weather, wonderful people. Uh, and so I reached out to administrators, uh, at Oklahoma State and said, I'm looking for some opportunities. And they were gracious enough to put together a program. And so I came here, did a dual uh, PhD in internal medicine residency at the vet school and uh, finished that up in December of 2008 and um, uh, moved on to faculty as a lecturer initially and then assistant professor and, and associate professor. Okay. So, um, why public health then? Like, why did you make that combination? Uh, well, so I was a political science economics major and uh, I realized I didn't want to be an attorney and, and I figured out I wasn't going to go to politics. Once I learned my own mother wouldn't vote for me, I kind of knew that I, I didn't have a career in politics. So, um, but those, those political public servant uh, aspects still uh, resounded with me. And mm -hmm. so uh, when I, I, I was very intrigued at a, a very in, uh, informative uh, relationship with a faculty member of Virginia Tech, Will Houston, who uh, had been involved in public health, USDA during uh, bovine sponge form encephalopathy, a, a big public health slash animal health mm -hmm. uh, period. And um, that just kind of reignited that interest and realized that there was an intersection between my two interests, right? My between my two, my two professional interests. And so I kind of knew all along I didn't want to be in practice forever. 
I thought it was a good experience to get, you know, it's kind of like getting your wisdom teeth cut out, you know, you you kind (laughs) of need to do it to fit in with everybody else. But, um, so when I had the opportunity to do the MPH, it, 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 it very much spoke to, to where I wanted to do and where I wanted to be. So. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what about your um, epidemiology work? Like, how did you get into that? So um, I'm very much a, a, a rational driven individual. Um, and, and, and always have been. And it didn't, I, I, I had a, Again, a very formative experience with a, a person who's now on faculty here uh, who told me one day very bluntly, Jared, you're not like other people. <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> what? What do you mean? Um, but I've always. That's a very broad statement. I right? realized, you know, that, that was very helpful to me. And, but I was, I was always that way. I was always very uh, rational. Give me the information. Allow me to work through it. Um, somewhat numbers, uh, you know, affinity, and uh, so it just it, it just made sense. It clicked mm-hmm. for me, and um, that was definitely within the public, uh, within the MPH study domain. Uh, that was definitely the discipline that was just my natural fit, and so that's where I leaned. And then when I came here, I had, actually had a, a pretty broad opportunity for what I was going to do my PhD in and decided, uh, well, I say broad, within a very niche topic, I had (laughs) quite a bit of discretion and chose to go toward molecular epidemiology and bovine respiratory disease. And so, um, yeah, and I was kind of hooked at that point. So the molecular part, I sort of moved away from over time. Uh, So I had that experience. I had that familiarity of it ability to speak that language. I've done postal gel electrophoresis, rapid PCR, sequencing, mm-hmm. microbiome. I've done those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's always been a means to an end uh, for me. Uh, the, the end was always to put it all together in a, an epidemiologic package. And so um, that's kind of what started me with that toward that was looking at bovine respiratory disease and the, the pathogens involved with that and um, went from there. Yeah. Um. That makes sense. And especially, you know, that it sounds like, you know, like understanding and working in the science, but also being able to look at a larger picture and communicate with people. <laughs> yeah. What I'm hearing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I do kind of want to like move into the, the mm-hmm. focus of the interview. Right. Um, so I working as an epidemiologist, um, I'm trying to think about like, do you, do you remember like from your perspective, like when things were coming in sort of on the public news, like when it started to look like, oh my gosh, this is something that we have to pay attention to. Like at what point did you sort of like look at the news as it was unraveling, or maybe you had different intel than normal people, I don't know, and say, oh gosh, this is going to be a thing that disrupts with Um, with COVID. You know, I I guess I'll, I, it was a double-edged thing. So I was actually teaching, um, a public health epidemiology course in the, the spring of 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the first time that I taught that course in person. Uh, I taught the online version in the summer for years, but this yeah. was the first year to, to teach the in-person. And so I was really excited about that. It was a much better dialogue and opportunity to interact with the students. And, uh, you know, by, by the time that we had any cases in the U.S., I mean, I, I, I was just very casually just said, we're not going to control this. There's no controlling it at this point. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't think I had this great understanding of the repercussions. I did not envision uh, the shutdown, the, you know, I think probably because if anyone would have, if I would have sat down and talked about it, it would have been like, you yeah, can't do, you, you're still not going to get out of that. Right. Uh, but yeah, it was at that point that I, I basically told students, you know, I don't know exactly what they're doing because it's, it's not going to go away at this point. We're not going to get rid of it. And, uh, yeah. So that was, I don't know, early February, probably. Yeah. This is where I knew that. So. 
So whenever things started changing, and um, I think it was like mid-March that there's sort of all these announcements were made at the university level, but also at sort of the state mm-hmm. level um, about schools closing and things mm-hmm. like that. Well, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, were you a part of those conversations at the university level? So it was not at the university level. Uh, what happened was um, they they we took spring break, right? And, right. and it was like, <laughs> We had a break. Now we're going to see what happens, right? And I was contacted by a representative from the university regents who said, hey, we're putting together a team to to do some consulting for the governor and the the secretary of health and the commissioner of health. And and, and actually, the first thing I got actually before that was this very kind of cryptic email of, the governor's office was provided this document. Could you review it and give your thoughts? And and it was this projection of um, of impact on the state of Oklahoma, COVID. And I don't remember that it had a time frame. So from that perspective, you could be like, well, yeah, eventually all 3.9 million Oklahomans are going to die. So you know, it wasn't that wrong, mm-hmm. but it it had this astronomical number, like 70,000 deaths or something. And I. I I like that. I was like, there's, there's no, there's no scientific rational basis for this. And so I spent part of a day, you know, going back at the envelope calculation, single-handedly kind of trying to, and pushed it back. I was like, you know, not, I don't know where this came from. Right. I don't know what, but no. And so then they reached back out to me like that afternoon, the next day and, and said, we were putting together this modeling team. And so there were four of us who went down to the city and met with the governor and his advisors. And, um, you know, to the point of when did we realize that, uh, you know, this wasn't, this was going to be a big deal. I, I remember the governor, as we, we presented our model and showed sort of what it looked like. And he looked at it and said, that, but your model's still showing um, 3.7 million Oklahomans being infected. And, um, I missed the opportunity, I think, at that point, in hindsight, to explain, yeah, that's the way it works. <laughs> it's a question of when, right? Uh, when do we get to that number? We can get there really fast and disastrously, or we can get there more slowly and in a controlled manner. And um, yeah, that's what the model showed because that's what has to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Yeah, that was, again, a, a failure on my part. I answered the question and addressed it, and I think I spoke about some of the time, but I didn't really hit one of, yeah, the point is we're not going to put a stop to this, you know, in the short term. Mm-hmm. Um, so was that, was some of that modeling then, that's what went on to inform some of the initial response or that early response then? Yeah, so it was a really complicated situation in the health department. Uh, they had had a state epidemiologist who had been there for quite a while. I had a great relationship with her. She got sucked into the vortex, which was really unfortunate. It's not, she had no thing, nothing to do with it with the third, with the 2018 financial debacle. Oh, and so she was out. So they promoted one of her deputies and he was fine. He did a fine job, but then he got sideways with the commissioner pretty early. And so they summarily dismissed him mm-hmm. and they brought in an interim a state epidemiologist and this guy was you know in, an interim introduced in the midst of a pandemic or at the beginning of a pandemic and so they were just bringing in uh outside perspectives and assistance and so we served as an advisory role uh in, to him and his team and the governor and the governor's team uh, in conjunction with a a parallel group from ou that we worked in that capacity for a month, six weeks, something like that. Uh, Eventually, sort of the, all models suck, all models are flawed, all models are terrible. Um, Ours was not particularly worse than anybody else's, but sure wasn't any better than anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And you revise it, you know, every week and it was different and people got frustrated by that. And I kind of understand that. And so, you know, by the time you get to the sixth iteration and it looks radically different than the first iteration, they kind of lost interest in it. And so that activity went away probably by early May. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Um, so how did you feel then about a lot of the 
the sort of closing orders about schools closing and then businesses and restaurants and things like that? Um, I, at the time, I wasn't. Um, I think I probably took my dispassionate numbers approach too far. Mm -hmm. I, I was basically, um, I divorced myself from any of this is what to do. It was more, this is what will happen. This is a likely yeah. deviation. If we do this, if we go here, if we go there, yeah. um, I'll also say it was pretty hard to, um, it would have been really hard to have buck the conventional wisdom, right? I mean, again, I got this document that 70,000 Oklahomans are going to die. And, and I, I knew that that was really misguided from the get go. Um, but when your audience has heard that, if not, even if they don't believe it, you, you're starting at a very different part of the dialogue. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would not begin to say that I, um, you know, profess to, to predict, the 7,000 that actually died in, in the year, in the nine months, nine months, roughly from its first introduction. Um, you know, but that's one tenth of the, the larger number. I, I didn't predict that, but I, I mean, I knew that it was going to be a whole lot smaller than the 70,000, but it was, it, I would have never also said like, oh, I'll just go on with normal life, everything, you know, let them go through. Um, in hindsight, I really wish I would have been more assertive and said, um, let's be incremental, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I didn't, I said, I, I largely just stayed. That's your job. You know, I looked at policymakers and that's your job. You tell me what you want from the data mm -hmm. and then you make the decision of what to do with that data. Yeah. Well, and <clears throat> I mean, from the outside perspective or, or some, yeah, someone who's not, doesn't study this and, you know, understands history, but not public health history necessarily. I mean, it looks so unprecedented, you know, and almost impossible to make decisions, right? Because it's not like you could look backwards five years and be like, well, this is how we averted it this time, right? But maybe I'm wrong. No, you're, you're largely right. Um, it, it, the only remote precedent is a 1918 influenza um, pandemic. And we had other diseases that we sort of leaned on and probably erroneously, right? I mean, we was, whether it was SARS, MERS, um, would have been the, the big ones, we were able to squash those. Mm -hmm. They never, they never ballooned up. And, um, and again, I think we leaned on that erroneously because again, even by February, we knew that this SARS-CoV-2 is not SARS and it's not MERS. Uh, the transmission patterns are just very, very different. And so then the next thing you fall back to were the other periodic influenza pandemics, uh, but they, they're happening at a very different scale and scheme as well, because they're annual and they're going to go away on their own just because of the antigenic shift and drift that normally takes place with influenza. Mm -hmm. So you're right. There was no precedent and, or, or it was very hard to make that precedent and, and, uh, you realize now that we have a lot more in common with 1918 than we realize, but I wasn't a historic uh, epidemiologist mm -hmm. by any means. And, and I wasn't looking back a century uh, yeah. as much as I probably should have been. Are you sort of referencing the, the pushback against public health measures in 1918, like the masking yeah. and the, the well, congregating? Yeah. Well, and just, um, I mean, look, we've had phenomenal progress, right? I mean, the vaccines are just an amazing work of science. Uh, the antiviral medications that we're getting now are, are, are a wonderful addition. Uh, but in the absence of that, viral transmission hasn't changed since the beginning of viruses. Mm -hmm. You know, our understanding of it's changed, but it hasn't. You know, mm -hmm. wear masks sanitation, uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. It's very fundamental, very, very straightforward. And then yet the pushback you get on that is, is intriguing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> predictable, maybe just yeah. human nature predictable. I guess so. I mean, again, <laughs> I, I wasn't good at predicting it at the time. Mm -hmm. I was I was taken aback. I was surprised. By yeah. It. So whenever I guess some of those early measures and still sort of consistent messaging now about, um, you know, like wearing masks, especially in really, you, you know, like uncontrolled situations and things like that. Um, did you how did you feel about like that that plan unfolding about messaging for masks and, and trying to encourage the general population to. Um, so. Or the plan for, for so that. so yeah. I mean the first there was so much happening. Mm. I mean there was so much happening and and I mean as you said just to talk about my personal experience yeah. I'm just yeah um, you know so again I was teaching the Epi course right. Mm -hmm. We got to spring break. Well, guess what? My teaching didn't end right at, at spring break right, and and I wasn't just teaching the Epi course uh, the MPH course. I was teaching a. Um, to veterinary courses as well. Yeah. And so I continued teaching those courses and doing this modeling and consulting activity. Uh, and, and, and even once I finished, I taught a summer course and I, and my consulting picked up and it was more. And so there was just so much stuff going on that it was all very reactive. Mm. And so that's the answer to your question of well, how did I feel about the messaging and everything? Um, uh, no matter what I wanted it to be and no matter what I said we were going to try to do, it, it, every day was reactionary. Yeah, it, it was just, it was impossible, at least for me and for anyone around me apparently, um, to step out and have that vision and say, okay, people, now we're here. The next step is this, then it's going to be that. And clearly we needed that. We needed somebody to do that. It didn't happen. It didn't happen even at the national level. It didn't happen on the global stage. Mm -hmm. um, you really did have very flawed and failed messaging that, uh, you know, after four months and people were saying, okay, we flattened the curve. We won, right? Let's go. And, and, and we didn't have an answer to that. I mean, really, nobody did. Yeah. Did you think that that was true, or were you looking at your data and kind of saying, "Oh yeah, oh. we knew it wasn't." I mean, yeah. we knew it wasn't, and 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 again, I was very much at the point of just saying, "I'm a numbers guy. I'm not a policy guy, so I'm not going to tell you guys what you need to do." Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we were following what percentage of the population is infected and we know where we got to get. It was a 3.7 out of 3.9 ish number. Mm -hmm. We're not there. And until we're there, we flattened a curve for now, but as soon as you unleash, it's, it's going to go back up. So, I mean, I knew it was there, but it, yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, that kind of in August of 2020, you became interim state. Yes. Like, walk me through like, like how did, how did yes. that happen? And so why did you say yes? And <laughs> that's a really good question. And I, we don't have time to answer. <laughs> um, so as I said, they, they had an interim epidemiologist when, when I was brought in the consulting role and played that part for a while. And then we sort of had an ebb and then by June ish, I was getting periodic emails from them. Just, what are your thoughts? Could you give your perspective on these kind of things? And I was fine to do that, happy to do that. And my wife will never let me, you know, let it down. And she said, they're gonna ask you to be the state epidemiologist. I went, run, run. And I said, they're not gonna ask you to be the state epidemiologist. So she, she, you know, she loves us. I told you. <laughs> um, that individual um, did not, find success in the position. And they were, they, the, the department was looking for another way to go. And, you know, quite simply, they had gotten rid of the most experienced individual two years earlier. They had pushed out the second most experienced individual six months earlier. They landed on a third and now they're looking for a fourth. Right. And, uh, so they offered a position to me and, and I knew without a doubt, unequivocally, I was not going to join that permanently. And honestly, I, the, the analogy I make is like, uh, when, when you're a reasonable, attractive person, I assume I don't have this personal experience, but you're a reasonably attractive person and you get asked to the prom by, you know, 
and, and they're a great person and you, you don't want to hurt their feelings and you just don't tell them no right away, right? And then you wait a while and you realize, I can't tell them no now because it's just too late. That's basically what happened. I mean, they offered me the job in July and for an August one start date. And, you know, by July 20th, they're inviting me to come down and meet people. And I was like, um. <laughs> and so I, I basically just backed into it by not saying no, uh, but told them emphatically, unequivocally all along, I'm not leaving Oklahoma State. There's no way I'm leaving a tenured faculty position for what's clearly a line, minefield. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yes, I was hired into the position as an interim uh, August one. Um, and and whew, I mean, it was uh, it was it was phenomenal. I mean, it was it was it was a great experience in its own way. I mean, it was very, very invigorating to me personally uh, because I looked at it and said, I've got five months. I know I'm here from August to December and there's these things that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I've got to go. I've got to do as much as I can do. And so. So why did you think at that point you're only there till December? That's what. That's what the appointment was. Okay. Um, I laid that out. I, my, I have a very heavy teaching load in the spring. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to keep my job at OSU, I've got to keep my teaching portion of it. 50% um, teaching. And uh, I do research and service and other things. But those you can be a little more fluid and flexible with. And so the college was very supportive of me taking that leave of absence for five months. But I knew I needed to be back for the spring semester. And so I told him that's what I'll do. And so it was very, very circumscribed for me. And um, like I said, very invigorating. I did not achieve a, a tiny fraction of what I wanted to. Um, but I tried. <laughs> <laughs> what was your what was your plan for those five months then? Like, what did you hope to accomplish? Uh, so the biggest my mantra when I went in was we needed to move from data to information, mm -hmm. and and quite honestly, we've still not. I love NPR. I love KOSU. I want to punch my radio every morning when they lead the local news with. Original death count increased by 12 today and a seven day rolling average. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Who cares? Every one of those individuals who's died as a person and or somebody's family member and it's tragic for them. But that's data. Those numbers are just data. And, and we've still not gotten to the point of saying, can we make something more meaningful out of that? So that was a big thing for me is I wanted to get away from this deluge of numbers that everyone was chomping at the bit for on a daily, in some cases, seemingly hourly basis. Somebody wanted data, but no one knew what to do with it and no one did anything meaningful with it. They just wanted to consume data. Mm -hmm. And that was my big mantra. Um, what that turned into, what that translated to was to do that it requires major technological capabilities, which the department did not have. So I came in and my first task ultimately was to uh, pick up what work had been done and it, it was good work, but it wasn't complete for guiding schools for reopening in early August, right? Yeah. So we had to crank that out really quickly, get that finished and put out provide all this guidance to the schools of coming in and that, that consumed everything to begin with. And I come in and introduced and met with everybody and they, they told me, okay, we've, we've got these horrible antiquated record systems. They're terrible. We know they're terrible. They're crashing every day. They're creating problems, but we spent millions of dollars more buying new systems and they're going to be online by middle of September. And I said, cool. Okay. I'm working over here. I can't wait until we get this. Yeah. And, you know, come middle of August, September, it's like, well, it's not quite ready. Two more weeks. And, and we got to about middle of August and I was like, no, seriously, I need to know what's going on. And I found out it was just a total wreck. And that was a failure on my part, I guess, for not getting more meshed in that to begin with. But again, we were so reactionary. So you get into it in October and realize what had been promised was going to happen in September. We were still months away from, it was a disaster. And, um, and so then it became, I became a technocrat. I mean, I, I was just trying to um, 
organize what we had to do with very flawed systems while also trying to shepherd the technological creation of systems that I knew nothing about, yeah. uh, contracts that I hadn't negotiated, <laughs> you know, yeah. any of those kind of things. And still yet show up twice a day on the media front to say, you know, wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands. Yeah. Stop listening to the daily provisional. Yes, yes. Um, well, and, and I wonder, you know, some of that <clears throat> is also has to do with that, that messaging, whereas you got plunged right in the front center of being the news, right? So you mentioned like, and this still goes on, like we still start every day with like the COVID counts of the day are. Um, and I often think about this in the sense of how, yeah, like how, how, just bizarre it feels right um and not but also wondering like how we got to the point where where that's like the communication point like right like that's i don't i don't know how we got to the point of that messaging yeah. and you being on the other side of the news camera you know i think about that too like you're trying to shape news <laughs> like how do you feel about like the the news coverage and the the media in response to all this and do you think some was done well do you think absolutely i mean in in the grand scheme of things i had great relationships with the press uh, i never i can't remember a single incident where i felt ambushed where i felt um abused uh, I don't ever feel misquoted. There's plenty of times where <laughs> you take, a, I mean, sometimes literally a 30, 45 minute interview and they distill it down to 15 seconds and you're going, oh, good Lord, <laughs> that's terrible. Uh, but I, do, I never thought there was anything malicious even about that. So, I mean, I do feel like the media was trying to do their job and, and that they were respectful and they did it right. Um, the fact that the public has an attention span somewhere between an E. coli and an at is not beneficial. And um, I, I think that's a huge part of it. Again, we also struggled with as a department uh, to ever get to that information vantage point. Um, you know, we, I so desperately wanted to be able to say, um, you, you know, the, the, the source, the predominant source of clustering we're seeing right now is in bars or daycare centers or whatever. We just did not have a record system that would facilitate that. So, so maybe what I'm hearing is that you, you saw that pattern, but you didn't have the data to mm -hmm. back it up, right? Like you didn't have the, the verifiable data. Right. And, and so there's a two edged sword there too. Um, that Oklahoma is not inherently different from New York or Florida or California or wherever in terms of just overall society, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, you always want to be the one who finds something new and informative and dramatic. But if you don't, there's nothing wrong with learning from what the other folks found, right? And and, you know, if we're seeing something from India or China, okay, we need to take that with a grain of salt. If whatever we learned on a cruise ship may not apply, you know, but at some point when you're seeing it evolve from multiple sources and they're all kind of pointing toward the same thing, there's not a great reason for us to say, well, we don't know that that's true in Oklahoma. And there were some people and policymakers and whomever else who wanted to take that position. Well, we want Oklahoma specific data. Well, Oklahomans share biology pretty closely with others. I'm not a native Oklahoman. <laughs> I still think that my respiratory physiology and immunology works largely the same as yours. So yeah. that was a challenge. I wanted to deliver Oklahoma specific information but at some point you just so let's learn and adapt to what information is out there and respond to that appropriately and we did there were struggles with doing that well and um i know i saw a talk you gave last year at, at like a the 
like digital information conference, like Cadre oh, yeah, conference, yeah, yeah. right? Um, where you were talking about how the system, the information health system that you were working with was 20 years old, like just in 2020, it was 20 years old, right? And so that was sort of the starting point for this. And it seems like that's where a lot of these challenges came from, which you referenced. Um, so I, yeah, like it, it's hard to explain, I'm sure, um, how, how you're trying to build a plane while you're flying yeah. and re reacting every day as well. Like you said, being more reactive. Um, but I'm curious at this point, like, are there, I don't want to play like, what if, but I, I want to play like a little bit of moving forward. Like when you vision forward to if, if something like this is going to happen again, like how are you being asked to be like, what can we do in the future? Like, like how can we better prepare? What is things that are going to be, we need to prioritize to have in place? Well, so we probably ought to return, turn the recording off because this is my my scheme for getting rich in the future and I don't <laughs> want to divulge it to everybody because that right. would just undermine Don't give it. details, right? <laughs> um, you know, obviously that's facetious. Uh, I can't predict the future. I, I think what I've told sure. people what I, what I would first and foremost tell people is that the next COVID is not going to be COVID. Um, and we, we, I've not got any military experience and I can't tell you who the person is where this quote originated from, but the military quote is, you know, we build an army for la the previous war, the most mm -hmm. recent war. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, it's a very human thing to do, a very reasonable thing to do, right? Um, and, and, and but we gotta be careful of that because the next war is not gonna look like the past war. And, and so I, I see a huge problem with, with that. The other thing is FIDO, this terribly antiquated, it was public health infectious diseases and diagnostics of Oklahoma or something like that was a system, FIDO. Um, you're right, it was nearly 20 years old at the time. Um, it had been created in 2001 do you know what was the impetus for creation of that in 2001? That have been the anthrax and yeah. The, yeah. And, and so you had the terrorist attacks of September 11th mm -hmm. and it followed shortly by anthrax and you had foot and mouth disease in the UK. Right. And the amount of money that went to agroterrorism and bioterrorism, which were words that didn't even exist, mm -hmm. right? Until mid nineties, probably, I don't know. Again, I'm not a historian, but those words, those concepts didn't even exist and an enormous amount of money poured into them. And I can't tell you how many interviews were done of, well, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when foot and mouth disease makes it to the United States. And we've got to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And all this money went toward agroterrorism, bioterrorism, foot and mouth disease, early diagnostics. I know I've got a great colleague of mine who, who went down a rabbit hole on looking for rapid diagnostics of terrorist um, organism, bioterror or organisms, you know, that we were going to put sensors on every street corner to detect when somebody released ricin or um, Yersinia or whatever it would be. Yeah. Um, none of those happened. Yeah. Was that money wasted? Did we learn, did science progress based upon that? Absolutely. Do we have devices on every corner no should we have devices on every corner i would say no it would not be an economically wise investment so we could build the next generation of fido and make it infinitely better mm -hmm. and it may still be 20 years old and clunky by the time we get around to really needing it next time so is the question then just more consistent preparedness or res more consistently resourced I think so. I mean, and, and, and I'm an academician first and foremost. So, you know, the, the famous line is more research is needed, right? Uh, no matter yeah, I think it's what's money and then more research. Yes, is needed. Uh, exactly. Um, but I mean, th there's truth yeah. to that. I really, really believe that. I think that we would be better off funding more basic yeah. pursuits that you can then pivot and be more responsive to rather than trying to build this military industrial complex like public health 
industrial complex infrastructure that's geared toward fighting foot and mouth disease or African swine fever is a big one now or, or COVID. Yeah. Uh, we really need to continue to invest in the basic stuff and then, you know, not to, not to undermine the infrastructure, right? But that you can't just go and try to build. Uh, I can't begin to predict what we're going to need, mm-hmm. you know, for the next pandemic or next public health emergency. Whatever that's going to be. Um, so I, I do think that that's important. And I also ha- I want to think too about like your situation with, um, you know, animal health and people health, right? Like public mm-hmm. health. Um, are there any concerns um, about this, about like COVID transitioning to animals? Like, I, I'm wondering how all of that sort of, I have no idea how that works. Yeah, so so there is concern. And, and that's again, sort of this two-sided coin where uh, there is evidence that there's been some serologic work done in white-tailed deer and mm-hmm. relatively high prevalence of antibodies among white-tailed deer to COVID. Mm-hmm. We obviously know cats are quite susceptible to it. Um, does that mean there's a potential risk? Absolutely, there's a potential risk. Is that the main driver of transmission now? Surely not. Is it going to make them a reservoir in the future such that we can't eradicate it? Potentially. Are we ever going to get to eradication anyway? It's a long way off, Mm -hmm. right? And so, um, Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think we can focus obsessively on the animal reservoir question. We really still have to get the whole you know, let's get vaccinated yeah. and and minimize our risk kind of thing in the human population first. Um, but yeah, if we, if, if I think we are going to be stymied in eradication efforts based upon it being a, a truly zoonotic disease and now it's become so ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and those diseases are tough to get rid of. I mean, tuberculosis, brucellosis are examples of diseases that we just have endemic in, in the U.S. wildlife. Uh, it doesn't cross into the human population commonly, but those are transmitted radically differently. Those diseases are transmitted radically differently. So respiratory disease poses more of a risk in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I think it, uh, most of that poses a risk toward eradication, which is a long way off anyway. So speaking of like vaccinations and, and sort of continuing to try and keep the public health measures that have been that have been sort of preached um like where do you think we are on that like how do you do you uh, because it seems like there's still quite a bit of vaccine hesitancy Mm -hmm. i mean the fact that i know the term vaccine hesitancy (laughs) probably says a lot um in the state and i'm wondering if you think that there's going to be a way that that's you, you know like how do we overcome come that have you? I, I don't know how we magic overcome wand. it. Yeah, I don't know how we overcome it. It is real, um, and 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 I've had dialogue with with several people about you know how do you go about it. We've had vaccine mandates for a long time, and 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 so I see there's there's two ways. I mean, one we can look at COVID and say, well, COVID is unique in in so many ways, not the least of which is its politicization. Mm-hmm. And okay, let's just go ahead and set it over here and we just won't touch it as a mandate because we don't want to jeopardize our ability to mandate MMR, diphtheria, other other vaccines. Um, or the other is let's normalize it and say it's not that different. It's an infectious disease and we've, we've done this in the past. I don't know. Uh, I, I do. There is a risk, assuredly, to try to drawing attention to the fact that we've had vaccine mandates for quite some time. And we're, we're seeing that there's now pushes for folks in opposition to those basic public health measures that we've had in place for decades. Um, and that's really scary. And if we let the genie out of the bottle, I mean, we, we can't stop talking about it now and think that these folks are going to forget it. Right. And so. Uh, you know, the answer is always more communication and science and rely on the facts. Um, 
I mean, I'm, I'm speaking very bluntly, which I try not to do in front of a camera too often, but it's just, it's so politicized mm -hmm. that we're just not going to escape it. it it's, um, uh, and it's unfortunate, it didn't have to be that way. I mean, there was, there was a, I lived, I, I was active at a turning point when the vaccines came out and they could have been um, embraced fully and vigorously by everyone and made it non-wedge issue at all. Uh, but it wasn't, and, and it's too late. So why, like, how was it not? Um, cause I don't know if what you saw is the same thing as what I saw, right? I bet a so. Different positionality. Um, um it, it was at a national level with national leadership of just looking to minimize the pandemic as a whole and the science and everything that undermined the pandemic. And, and I want to be clear, I always said, just maybe to a fault, all I'm going to do is deliver data and, and those are policy decisions. I was asked an in, innumerable number of times what my thoughts were on a mass mandate. And, you know, I generated data that said mass mandates work, but the functional word is masks. The mandate is not the functional word. The functional word is masks. And ultimately imposing a mask mandate is a political decision. And that is up to the policymakers. Um, and, and I still hold that in terms of any type of mandate, any type of um, those kind of things. What I, and I'm fine with people looking at the same data and coming to different conclusions um, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan famously said, you're entitled to your opinions. You're not entitled to your own facts. Mm -hmm. And, and we got into a point where facts became irrelevant and, and, um, that's what did it. I mean, that's what started it. And then when the vaccines got here, it, it, it mushroomed from there. Mm -hmm. So is there points where you uh, are, so is there a point where you look back and think, I wish I would have taken that step forward? I know that that's a weird thing to ask, but I also, you know, sort of hearing with the reactive versus reflective. So, you know, I, I don't think it would have mattered. I, I, I mean, first and foremost, I, I feel in good conscience for everything I ever spoke to any policymaker, any leader, any person in authority. Um, and to the public, I mean, I feel in good conscience, everything I, I said was true and factual and accurate. And, and I didn't, I didn't pull punches. I mean, I never, that was, a, I, I told him from the day I got there, I've got another job. You fire me anytime you want, and I will lose no sleep over it. I was proud of that and very confident and comfortable with that. And so I had some pretty, uh, Un what would have been uncomfortable conversations and I was fine with it. So I don't feel like I, I missed any of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I, I could have said more, done something different. I, I don't think it was going to change anything. Yeah. It was at a meta level. Um, yeah. Well, we're still, we're still having the same we are. discussion on that. We are. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and again, it's uh, the vaccines are, are an amazing thing and, and the drugs are a great thing and that's fine. And yet, since when would we ever say, oh, don't worry about prevention. Let's just go ahead and treat it. Right. I mean, Ben Franklin, right. Ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. I mean, we've known that for a couple of centuries now. Um, but I honestly, I think there's going to be a much stronger embrace of treatments than there are of vaccines. And that's mind boggling for me as well. And from a medical perspective, that's indefensible. It really is because uh, those medical treatments are miraculous in what they do in terms of saving that person's life, preventing severe disease. We don't know all of the aspects of long COVID. We don't know how those medications are going to uh, head that off, impact that if, if they are. Um, 
vaccines, we don't know exactly how they do on that regard either. But again, a very basic mantra, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, still holds. And the diseases, uh, the, the vaccines are about prevention. Treatments are about treating. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have one thing I wanted to follow up on too, and that was you talking about it as you first came into that um, state epidemiologist role, um, that one of the first things you did was basically try and help finalize a return to school. Like that's not a small thing. No. <laughs> that was a small statement. It's not a small thing. No, yeah. Um, Cause that was, I mean, obviously everything about all of this is very political, but that was so political as well as emotional and ex yeah. ex exhausting. So people. it was, so there were several wonderful, great things. I had a wonderful relationship uh, with Joy Hoffmeister and everybody in her office and they were so responsive and so great at facilitating all of that um, and, and great to work with and very responsive and very reasonable in their expectations and all of those things and the and then the so that was the one side right that's the educational system and then the other side that worked hand in hand with that is the county health departments and they were just as fabulous and not more great wonderful people in all the county health departments and so we built a um we built a you know the broad brush infrastructure kind of document that could not begin to lay out you know every possible scenario and everything it was to give yeah. some overall general guidance and then it was the job of these you know the county health departments the educators and me and my office and group to fill in the details right as the circumstances emerge and new scenarios and that sort of thing and we had great partnerships and working groups to respond to that and um you know honestly if probably the only quasi regret that and it just was the way it was. We had a really, I thought we had a really great opportunity uh, to do a study, uh, not a study. It wasn't a study, but it was gonna be an opportunity for a policy that would have provided a lot of data, mm -hmm. which was we wanted to do in-school quarantine. Mm -hmm. And um, in-school quarantine. So if you knew you had an exposure in school, you can go ahead and come to school we're gonna test you with these brand new miracles of science, rapid diagnostic tests. We had a, an abundance of those made available to us. We're gonna test you nearly every day. We laid out days one, two, five, seven, 10, 14, whatever. And if you tested negative, you get to quarantine in school. And, um, and if you test positive, we gotta go home. Mm -hmm. We did not know how much transmission was taking place in schools. We didn't know how much transmission was taking place anywhere. But no one in the country, in the world, knew how much transmission was taking place among minor minors in a school setting. And uh, our, our triumvirate of, of cooperators came to this conclusion, we can do this study. And we got, we, we rolled it out, we announced it, and we were ready to do it. We had a school, uh, Mustang schools were gonna do it with us. And CDC changed the policy to where you could shorten the, the quarantine and all the momentum went out, you know, because there were a lot of people and it got ridiculed by a lot of folks of, um, I mean, and it was largely, I understand where they were coming from, but they were so cautious, right? And. And, and but that goes back to the whole 70,000 deaths. We need to shut everything down. Everybody needs to quit living kind of thing. We had reasonable anecdotal data and anecdotal data that transmission was not horrible in schools. Remember, this was pre Delta, yeah. pre Omicron. You know, this was a, the parent strain, and there was evidence that transmission in schools was not tremendous. And we knew we were having tremendous impacts on kids by them not being in school, by them quarantining repeatedly over and over, missing so many experiences. We had an opportunity to inform the nation based on Oklahoma. And we had all of our cooperators were willing to, to step out there and do that. And uh, the timing just 
fell apart, which is really unfortunate. Eventually, other studies come out in January and April and so on that said, oh, golly gee, there wasn't very much transmission going on there. And, and that was that was very observational driven data that was uh, that I, th I still have confidence in, but it was not nearly as robust as the data that we were going to be able to generate. So, uh, it, but you're right. I mean, back to your original point in question, yes, trying to address that was huge. The closest I got to quitting that job was about high school football. Oh, tell me more about that. It was just uh, people got really bent about high school football. And we were trying to figure out quarantine policies and the idea that you were going to keep somebody's son from playing on Friday night. Um, and there were um, there were pressures exerted that said, you know what, we need to we just got to pick our battles was kind of the phrasing that the, the approach. And um, yeah, that was the closest I got to quitting. And what happened that I, I sort of stepped in and um, I came out of that and said, okay. And so what, what was happening is we actually had epidemiologists watching high school football film to try to determine exposures. Mm -hmm. Because the idea you were going to quarantine the whole team, woo wee! So we had epidemiologists watching high school football film to try to figure out who we were going to quarantine, and um, nobody wanted that. Really, nobody wanted that. And the solution was, we'll just let the coaches and the, the, the those folks do it. And and so I said, you know what? Okay. But here's where I stepped in it. I got so used to winging it every day. I showed up and I would have a media request. Or I'd have a meeting request every day. And I just throw up and look at the camera. Let's go. I didn't even know who I was talking to. Well, I, I was talking to the State Board of Education and I didn't even know it. I didn't know who I was talking to. And I basically unilaterally, really, made this decision. Well, you know what? It's been said that football coaches should get to determine quarantine policies for football players. If we're going to do that, teachers, administrators could get to make their own decisions in the classroom. There's no way you can say this one's okay and that one's not. And that was my compromise was to say, I'm either going to walk out and say football needs to be handled like classrooms, or I'm going to stay here but say classrooms seem to be handled like football. And um, I think our counties love me for that because some of the hardest work they had was they were constantly trying to advise the schools and, and quarantine policies and practices. Um, but I really caught Joy Hoffmeister and her folks off guard because she was like texting me immediately after the meeting going, this is new to me. We need to talk about this. Can we have a call? And I was like, Oh my gosh, I didn't even know who I was talking to. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it all worked out. Yep. It all worked out. Well, and so in the that early recommendation, um, masks were part of that recommendation for the school, right? For mm -hmm. to be in class, like, you know, like we're following the national d data that we have, right? Masks, as much social distancing, as much fresh air as possible, and right? Um, and good quarantine testing measures. Um, and obviously, there were some roadblocks that threw up, were thrown up um, to be able to do that the second year. Do you feel like, and, and that's, you know, there was legislation that was that was passed basically saying that, you know, no schools were not allowed to mandate that. Um, do you feel like um, the policies you all set in like August 2020 were successful? And is that something that or is it something that by the time 2021 school year came around that things have changed so much that it didn't really affect? Well, so all of the above. Uh, I, I feel like the policies we set forth in August 2020 were, in hindsight, they were overly cautious, 
but I felt like we worked hard, particularly relative to other states, to recognize the negative impacts that, the, that those measures could have on schools. And so we tried to not be as cautious. Um, and, you know, if that makes sense. I mean, we still wanted to be cautious, but we didn't want to be overly cautious. Yeah. And and I, I think in, in hindsight, we were probably overly cautious, but I still think at the totality of it, we were very successful. Now, the, the recognition there is that, that that tenure was dominated by the parent strain. It was before Delta came. Right. And things were different when Delta, once Delta came. Delta transmission among minors was much more notable. Um, and uh, the virulence was more noteworthy, uh, not notable, but noteworthy in, in minors. And so arguably, if anything, those measures should have been retained from being overly cautious for the parent strain, but probably appropriate for Delta. Mm -hmm. But there had been, you know, such a negative uh, response to them being overly cautious with the parent strain that they wanted to loose any of those. Um, you know, and, and, and one thing that I wanna to talk about, you mentioned that the multitude of mitigation strat strategies. And um, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I always want to look at my own culpability and responsibility and, and, and maybe we could have done a better job. But I, I don't think it was much a, as much a failure of messaging as, as um, n people don't like nuance, right? People don't like complexity and, and they want the simple things and whatnot. But but the, the multitude of mitigation strategies was never really embraced. And the ability to layer those and, and build more protection. And then if you have one that isn't practiced as zealously as you could have, it may still be okay because you had two or three others in place, right? And so masking's not a panacea. Um, it, it's not gonna be the end all be all. Uh, but if you layer that on top of a couple other things, then it can be helpful. And again, if you have other things in place and one thing that killed me and, and, and coming from veterinary medicine, I, I had a, I was naive, I think really in the, the dialogue in human respiratory um, medicine, human respiratory infectious disease, human medicine, respiratory infection studies have made a huge deal about the distinction between aerosol and, and droplet transmission. And I was oblivious to that being this huge thing from the veterinary perspective. We've just always known mm -hmm. <laughs> that airborne is airborne. Mm -hmm. And, um, the human realm is catching up to that now, but I mean, it really was this huge deal and six feet, you know, which six feet is strictly about droplets as opposed to aerosol. You know, six feet is a pretty reasonable expectation for when droplets that have mass are going to fall to the floor. But that's completely disregarding of aerosol transmission. And, and, and so, I came in there knowing that six feet for 15 minutes was this general idea and ultimately more distance was better and shorter time was better, but most importantly, ventilation was better. And, um, and, and I, I felt like, again, I messaged that it wasn't received and you would get these stories that, that the schools were having students get up and move from seat to seat after 12 minutes to where they were not within six feet for 15 minutes. And you go, oh my goodness, you know, the, the desire to follow the letter of the recommendation completely superseded any attempt to understand and abide by the spirit. Yeah. And um, we're still struggling with that, right? And there's, there's, you know, there's things that come out, say, oh, well, six feet isn't magical. And, you know, you get certain people who look to weaponize that. You go, well, yeah, six feet's not magical. 
but you know, six, whatever we are apart here is better than if we were closer. And if we were sitting a little farther apart, it'd be better still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always said the, the, the Virians, the Virians don't carry around a, a measuring tape and run out to five feet, 11 inches. Ah, I'm going to stop. I reach my limit. Can't go any farther. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's hard. It, it is hard being someone who is all of a sudden expected to understand public health, right? Fair enough, because, yeah. Because, you know, I, I think that, I actually think that that's really helpful because being a parent trying to figure out, oh my gosh, like how do I make decisions and who do I listen to? And everyone's, you know, got these different ideas or even in the library, you know, we were quarantining books returned because at the beginning, right? <laughs> right, right. At the beginning, yeah. we're told like- yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Let it die for five days, yeah, right? You're absolutely right, yeah. Which was <laughs> horrible as well. Yeah, and we didn't do a good job of messaging that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I mean, but that's the thing, right? Like it's, it's reactive from the public side. So it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, you were waking up and being like, what's in front of me? Not only who you were talking to, but probably what information is new, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what information is new? How reliable is it? Uh, you know, the default was to go to CDC, yeah. but the CDC was so reactionary and so hyper-cautious as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another uh, time we had is I got the epidemiologists together, it was just, we got to have Halloween, right? I mean, they, they the counties were clamoring for guidance on Halloween. Yeah. And uh, the CDC was kind of slow in putting stuff out and kind of what you were getting the impression was that they were going to be super cautious. And and I, we just, we got the epidemiologists together and said, guys, we've got to have Halloween. Uh, you just, you got to give them something. And so let's give some reasonable recommendations and say, stay outside and that was the thing stay outside knock on somebody's door interact with them four feet apart for 25 seconds the risk there is stupid low mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. from i hate to say common sense it is informed by science and biology and immunology and virology and but to some extent common sense mm -hmm. uh, let the kids go trick-or-treating yeah it's fine But we, we struggled because the other side was folks saying, you know, you're going to risk your child's life to get a piece of candy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, if you look at it that way, yeah. but you risk their life for a piece of candy when you go to the gas station and let it, you know, whatever, there's risks in life. Yeah. What was the relationship with the CDC? Because I know, especially, I mean, that changed politically, um, just because of the yeah. the sort of political faction in power, you know, that changed and was politicized in, you know, a bigger way than I think we would hope or expect. Um, but I think that also caused a shadow of doubt and some about just sort of like, what is information? Like, what is information? So did that, did, did, um, did sort of like that politicization of even the CDC affect the work that you were trying to do or were you able to? Somewhat, um, much more so from the perspective that you just described of the loss in confidence. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still don't feel like their recommendations were ever really um, influenced shaded by political considerations, or at least not heavily so. I mean, I think it's naive to say no, I had nothing, you know, but I, I never felt like their, the, the sentiment, the, again, the overall spirit of the recommendations were ever tainted by, by political pressure. And, and I always had confidence in the bulk of what they were saying. As I said, where, where I really struggled was that they were slow, reactionary, sometimes ambiguous, uh, and very cautious. Mm -hmm. And so again, we were, we were pushing the envelope in large measure compared to what the CDC was, was advising in many, many ways. And I was still getting angry emails from parents and teachers and concerned citizens. Um, you know, we got a packet sent to us in the mail to my home address at one point of, uh, you know, pseudoscience from a concerned citizen, you know, which I, I concern my wife some, 
you know, uh, from the idea of these people going to the lengths of looking up your home address. I I didn't feel threatened by it, but I mean, I, I, she she had some concerns, and I understand that. Um, yeah. But you know, I spent innumerable hours composing emails and sending back to parents. Uh, you know, I get it. I understand. Uh, I just, if nothing else, I want you to know I'm a person and I'm a parent and, and, and I'm not, you know, this bureaucratic rubber stamper who's getting sadistic pleasure out of, you know, sending your kid home or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. that's all I could do at that point really was to, to try to send him an email and say, I get it. I'm sorry. You know, kind of thing. Uh, so, I mean, I spent a ton of time just doing that, which was ultimately, <laughs> you know, didn't, I, I don't think bore any fruit, but I, I felt compelled to do it. Yeah. Well, that's very human, <laughs> too, yeah. right? Um, so, you did not end your state epidemiologist in December 2020. Right. What actually happened? Like, so, um, <laughs> Um, I, the, the, I, I think basically what's been conveyed to me was the powers that be thought for sure that I would become so enamored of the lights and the glory that I would change my mind and I would keep the job. And uh, I was taken to lunch one time with uh, uh, the Commissioner of Health and the Secretary of Policy uh, of Science and Innovation and, and uh, the Deputy Commissioner and some different folks. and. Um, I said, I, I, I want to be involved. I'm glad to continue to serve in some role, but I'm going back to Oklahoma State. And uh, so they finally got the position advertised in late November, something like that. And we got a, a strongly qualified candidate that we interviewed in late December, I think. And, um, and, and, she got hired but then she wanted to give three weeks notice and so she came on january 24th or something like that as the uh, deputy state epidemiologist and so for about one month i was literally doing both jobs um and i I showed up in the beginning of the spring semester just cold i did absolutely no uh, typical preparation for teaching i would just walk in the classroom and be you know Mm -hmm. do the best i could as I was literally doing both jobs for that full month, she came on and she gradually took on the responsibilities. And so February was, you know, 60 hours, 60 to 70 hours a week. March was 50 to 60 hours a week. And by April, um, she had largely taken all of the, the state epidemiology responsibilities. And so she got the title April 26th, I think something like that mm-hmm. and, uh, and took over from that point. Um, but you stayed on to do something. Yes. So I'm chief science officer, which was a position that did not exist, uh, prior to, to the creation of it for me. And, um, it's a, a, I'm a three quarter time appointment, 75% OSU, 25% OSDH. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's largely a consulting role. Um, I've taken this doing sort of special projects on data analysis um, because again, they are so that they're very qualified and very capable and wonderful people are consumed 50 hours a week, generating the most mundane, boring, monotonous reports day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And even to this point, can't step back and take a bigger picture. And so, I try to, <laughs> is, is what it comes down to is periodically yeah. I try to do some special project data analysis. And then also again, just try to uh, outside perspective on some yeah. thoughts and suggestions. <clears throat> so has it gotten better for reporting, do you think, in the last, well, I don't know, year or six months really at this point, but for- So what? For data. Not just data, but being able to have some no. translated information. No, uh, in that regard, it hasn't. Um, I think our data overall are more 
are more reflective of what's happening. But <sighs> it's very dynamic. So when I was there, we had, I couldn't even tell you how many OSDH employees who spent all day doing their day job and would spend five hours a night manually typing in reports that came in from a fax. Mm -hmm. And they would get that into our system. And then we still yet, um, we didn't do anything with that. They just typed it in so that you had a record so that we could say that these many tests were done and that that lab could get paid for having done that many tests. But the data still did not go into our data management system because to do that would have been even more. Mm -hmm. We've now moved away from that, thank goodness. Um, no one's doing that anymore. Um, so the data that is coming in is compatible with going into an electronic laboratory record in ELR reporting format. So the data that we get is much more parsable, usable, meaningful. However, <coughs> we continue to have some labs that don't report. That's the same as it always was. Maybe better now than it used to be. Maybe worse. Who knows? But you've had the emergence of all these at-home testing which we have no pulse on. Those aren't reportable, right? And so it's just so different is what it is. It's, it's very different. Mm -hmm. Is it better? In some ways it's worse. In some ways it's very different. Mm -hmm. um, we're beyond the point that you're gonna be able to make use of that, um, really. Uh, um, and, and honestly, I mean, when we go back as, as crude as it sounds, as crude as it is, I always said the most meaningful count you have is mortality. Mm -hmm. We can count dead bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as much critique as people wanted to make about those, um, I have tremendous confidence in them as a cumulative surveillance tool. Mm -hmm. It's good. Is there a mistake made every once in a while? Sure there is. But as a cumulative surveillance tool, they're very reliable. Hospitalization counts are not as good, but they're better than case diagnostics, you know, and that's what you have. And, and so the case diagnostics are, are really very flawed because of any number of reasons. Um, it still gives you a sense of magnitude, but we knew we were never diagnosing 100% of the cases. We never have. And you really had to go to a model to have any ability to predict what percentage of cases we were diagnosing. And then it was still biased. We were, we were probably over-diagnosing in long-term care facilities, hospitals, places where they were doing serial testing all the time. We were probably diagnosing people who, um, you know, had had a previous infection that they haven't cleared or, or you know, whatever, false positives, you always have a chance for false positives, probably over-diagnosing in some of those situations, horribly under-diagnosing in high school football teams as an example. We were told, you know, they won't test. They will not take a test because they do, then they know they're out for a game at least and their teammates may get quarantined and whatever. So, um, and I, I think all of that is probably still pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, and you've mentioned this a couple of times. We've had, you know, different variants that have come and, you know, been also, you know, the messaging is con expect that to continue. Like this is the way the way it goes. Um, but where where are we now? Like what's the public messaging now in, in the short term and the long term? Do we just kind of stop paying attention at this point? Or are we still what can, what what's the plan? So um that's a really good question. <laughs> and given that I said we didn't have a great job, didn't do a great job of looking at that long-term horizon to begin with, you'd think we'd be better positioned to do that now, wouldn't you? Um, I want you to say yes. <laughs> and so, I mean, the short answer is we've got to improve our vaccination uptake. I mean, we really do. Um, more research is needed in other areas, as, as bad as that sounds. Um, my, part of my special projects <clears throat> data analysis has shown that we currently, as of December 7th, 2021, 
should be at a point where um, the disease should be no more than endemic. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's sort of epidemiology talk, but endemic means steady, stable, predictable number of cases. That's what you really achieve when you get herd immunity at its most elementary form. It means your every person who's infected is going to infect one new person mm -hmm. and it's going to perpetuate itself at a flat level. Um, our data indicates we should be at a point roughly of endemicity. Um, I don't know that the the waves of periodic data that come in support that. Mm -hmm. We're still seeing more fluctuation and, and variation than you should see with endemicity. And so that's where I say, I think more research is needed to know um, what's happening. Again, we know we never diagnosed 100% of the cases, and so you start extrapolating out and saying, okay, roughly 30 to 40% of the state, probably 40-ish percent of the state has been infected at this point. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean they're immune? You know, that becomes a real question. If we could assume that they're immune, you bet. 40%-ish have been infected, 50% percent-ish have been vaccinated. Now there's overlap there. So it's not just 40 plus 50 is 90. It's actually 40 plus 50 with the overlap gets us to about 75 to 80. That still ought to be good enough. But again, what we're seeing says it's not good enough. And so um, what we also know is that vaccine immunity um, is more predictable and consistent. It may not, it's certainly not perfect, but it's more consistent and predictable. And it's actually a great thing to tap, to, to top off natural exposure uh, immunity, immunity from natural exposure and infection. And so really the short answer is what do we need to do? We need to keep pushing on vaccine uptake. And obviously we need to get more products licensed for those who are five to 16 and, um, the products license for those who are under five and and get those populations entering in as well. Um, and I think there are opportunities for periodic overwhelming of the healthcare system even now, but I think it would be periodic and I think it's um, would reflect very poorly on the United States, the, the world leader in the 21st century to overwhelm our health capacity but I don't think it would ever be as macabre and disastrous as it could have been and was at certain earlier stages. I do believe we're on the downhill side of it in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but we it, it's gonna be here with us for a while. Yeah. The hope, and I won't say that Omicron's gonna, uh, uh, Omicron's gonna deliver this for us because we don't know enough, but and one thing that I, I've always tried to tell people, uh, what's the goal of an infectious agent? Mm -hmm. The goal of an infectious agent is simply to replicate itself, right? To persist. Uh, it's not to make you sick. It's not to kill you. It's not to make you miss your prom or your Friday night football game or your big exam. It's just to replicate. And generally, the quicker and more severely an agent impacts a person, the less likely it is to be transmitted. And, and so um, while it makes for great science fiction, eventually infectious diseases have always evolved to reach a detente with their host. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes that is through highly transmissible, but not excruciatingly virulent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if we, we can, if, if we end up with a strain that fits that, particularly if we get one that's immunogenic, that would be the trifecta mm -hmm. that's transmissible, immunogenic, but not virulent. Well, then it becomes a little more than a cold, probably less severe than influenza. 
because influenza has tremendous antigenic shift and drift. And yeah, we talk about, um, you know, the 13 variants that we've had to this point, but really we've had uh, a, um, alpha was a flash in the pan, beta was kind of a flash in the pan, delta was a real deal, and, and now we have Omicron. Mm -hmm. um, so really not that many. Uh, influenza changes every year. You know, and so um, I think it's conceivable that we become less than influenza, particularly again with with good uh, vaccine uptake. But. Yeah, that's helpful and interesting. Um, so I have one last question, and um, and this is sort of like the 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 put it on the shelf question, but. You, you did talk about the fact that, you know, like going into this, you hadn't really looked much at like, like what happened in the 1918 flu, right? Like, and that maybe even having studied that, you'd be like, oh, this might be predictable or people are, this is going to happen, right? So if you're thinking forward towards public health officials or just individuals or communities like 50 years down the road, what do you think it would be helpful for them to look back on this sort of event and and what would be helpful for them to know Ooh, i know that's a lot of i know i know i know um, i think <laughs> largely unfortunately one is to say human nature doesn't seem to change and um and so probably should anticipate many of the same battles obstacles um I, I mentioned my colleague who, who enlightened me with the statement, I'm not like most people. Um, I am like a lot of epidemiologists, and, um, and a, that, which means a lot of epidemiologists are not like most other people. And so I, I think we do need to talk to people about uncertainty. I think we need to empathize with people about the emotionality. Um, and. And it's fine to say, let's follow the science and let's let's follow the data and let's act rationally. But humans are not an inherently rational species. And um, they're not, I, I don't think 50 years from now, they're gonna be inherently different. So I, I think we, we really need to bear that in mind. And, and I think that needs to be <clears throat> an informative part of it. Secondly, I think um, be realistic about the horizon. Uh, again, we, we didn't do that. The, the famous mantra was, was flatten the curve and we didn't talk about what came after that. And uh, we did start sort of then talking, well, when the vaccine gets here, but we did the same thing. When the vaccine got here, then everybody was like, Ooh, the vaccine's here, we're done. It was like, well, no, we still gotta roll the vaccine out. We gotta get people to take the vaccine. We gotta get development of immunity. And, and so, you know, I think if if anybody really developed a game plan for the next pandemic, I think that would be some of those things is uh, uh, talk to them about with empathy and understanding of the emotional impact. Uh, recognize that everything has risks and that we can't live in a risk free society and, and just help people to weigh those risks appropriately and then help draw a realistic horizon for for them to move to. And of course, that's easy said than done. I couldn't have told you how long it was going to take to develop a vaccine. You know, we the fact that we had it in 10 months is absolutely phenomenal. The next time it may take four years. Um, I don't think it will. You know, I think science is advanced, but you know, if you get a different agent with with ability for immune evasion, you know, something like that, immune evasion, that sounds like immune evasion, <laughs> immune evasion, um, it could be a problem. But I mean, I think at the very least, you can lay things out of saying, well, we need to flatten the curve, but we probably don't need to do that by screen slamming everything to a halt because we're going to need to have a stop. Let's do a deceleration sustained path because we did a stop and then accelerate and then try to stop and then accelerate. And then, you know, well, let's, let's try to flatten that and, and, and have some landmarks and some benchmarks of what we're striving for. That would be my only very generic guidance of, of how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And as you said earlier, and I kind of blew past it, you know, I said focus on, on primary research. And I, th- I do think that's important, but we do have to have infrastructure, right? I mean, and, uh, I, I don't think you got to build the biggest, shiniest, fanciest, all the bells and whistles kind of system that's going to sit there unused. But we use these systems for other things. I mean, we monitor STIs, tuberculosis, uh, you know, foodborne disease, all sorts of infectious diseases we monitor and we have to. And we, we, so we need to have these systems, have something that's very, very functional and adaptable and invest in that. Don't expect it to last 20 years. You know, we don't expect our, most people don't expect their vehicles, most people don't expect their houses to last 20 years, I don't think. Who expects a technological fix to last for 20 years these days, right? You know, so yeah, you got to have that continual reinvestment, which we really struggle with. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, is there anything that um, we didn't talk about that you wanted to make sure we covered? Um, I, you know, I don't guess so. Um, other than, you know, I did mention, uh, I, I guess, the personal impact. I'll throw that in here. Ultimately, uh, I've been very in every way imagine why I've been very blessed, very fortunate. Um, <clears throat> I've had no loved ones die. Um, I got COVID at the health department from my supervisor, uh, but it was a very mild infection and uh, really inconsequential. Um, I said that the, the opportunity um, to, to take the state epidemiologist position was actually very professionally invigorating for me. It was exhausting. Um, I was ready to leave when I left, uh, but but it was uh, rewarding to, to you know, I, I ultimately what I, I wanted to serve the public servants who were there before I was and who continue to be there after I'm gone. There were people who put in um, you know, absurd amounts of work. I worked really tirelessly. I really did. And I didn't get the fruits of it. Uh, but I worked from the time that I got there to try to get rid of the seven day a week reporting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was nearly burned in effigy by some of the press when we successfully made it, made it to five days of a week reporting. Um, but there was a, member on the surveillance team who had a son who was born, I think in November of 2019, and he had hardly seen his kid grow up, you know? For data that again, was not changing anybody's actions, anybody's decisions, behaviors at all. This guy just had to show up and do it every day and he did, but that was not fair to him. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that got forgotten by uh, the people clamoring that we need data, we need to make decisions based on data. You're not making decisions, you know, you're biting your nails and deciding, what well, do I have Uber bring me the food or do I go to the drive-thru? But neither, it's not gonna change anything in your life kind of thing, you know, but it was impacting other people's lives. And now the flip side was, it was a it was extraordinarily impactful for so many people who, who did lose loved ones and, uh, I don't know that I played any role in making and minimizing that or in, in positively impacting anybody's life in that regard. I, I, I did what I could and I tried. And, um, you know, I, I do know that there was a tremendous team at OSDH that, that did their best in that regard. I was proud to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for talking to me for so long. <laughs> Um, I do think that this is really helpful, um, especially in the spirit in which we're having this conversation. So.